I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and what follows is the video that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the nuclear industry really don't want you to see. Dave Lockbaum from Union Concerned Scientists and I gave a presentation at the Boston Public Library about two and a half weeks ago. It was sponsored by several groups, including C10, and uh, it discusses how Fukushima can happen anywhere in the world. It's not just a Japanese problem, but in fact could happen in the United States, Germany, again in Japan, or anywhere there's a nuclear reactor. We talk about what the real root causes of the Fukushima event really were. Now, there's a sequence on here with his, which is the explosion at, um, at Fukushima slowed down. And I have to thank one of the viewers of our website, Jeff Sutton, who, who put that time-lapse sequence together. And uh, I really appreciate it, Jeff. Thank you. Well, buckle up your seatbelts and um, enjoy the, uh, the presentation at the Boston Public Library. Thanks. Uh, good evening. I appreciate C10 for hosting this event and you all for turning out. For those of you who don't know me, my name is David Lockbaum. For those of you who do know me, my name's also David Lockbaum. For some reason, it works out the same either way. I'm going to start out, Arnie and I are going to present what happened at Fukushima and why those vulnerabilities plague U.S. reactors, Seabrook, Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee. The type of reactor really didn't matter. The, the primary cause at Fukushima would have knocked down any one of our plants. So it's not a direct problem with GE reactors or boiling water reactors. It's a problem with nuclear reactors that we need to address. Okay. The, there were six reactors at Fukushima. Three of, the, three of them were operating at the time. Three of them were shut down for refueling, scheduled refueling at the time. Boiling water reactor on the left-hand side, the, the nuclear fuel is inside a reactor vessel. The heat from splitting atoms is used to warm water that's flowing upwards through the reactor core. That heat causes the water to boil. The, the steam leaves the reactor vessel and is carried through piping to a turbine that's connected to a generator, the spinning turbine generates electricity that goes out on the wires to consumers down the line. The steam leaving the turbine is then passed into a condenser, a large metal barn, basically. In this case, seawater was passed through tubes inside that condenser to cool the steam down, convert it back into water. The condensed water was then sent back to the reactor and used over and over again to remove steam, make steam, and spin the turbine. The warmed seawater was returned to the Sea of Japan for further use. This shows, this is called a simplified diagram, but it looks a little more complicated than the last one. The red portions show the steam lines going from the reactor vessel to the turbine as the, as the earlier, the even simpler diagram showed. The light blue lines, cyan lines, show the, the water going back from the condenser to the reactor vessel. This will come in more important in just a second. Two seconds. When the earthquake occurred, these reactors, because Japan's kind of susceptible to the earthquakes, those reactors automatically shut down within seconds when they detected ground motion caused by the earthquake. So within seconds of the earthquake or sensing that, the control rods inserted into the reactor core stopped the nuclear chain reaction and turned the reactors off. About a minute later, the turbine tripped. There, there's no more, not enough steam going through the turbine anymore, so the turbine tripped. The earthquake knocked out the electrical grid, the normal source of power to the, to the plant. When the turbine tripped, the generator tripped, that meant it wasn't producing any electricity for the plant either. So the earthquake and the turbine trip took away the normal source of power for the plant. This shows a, a close-up look. The red line shows the steam line going from the reactor vessel to the first valve that's inside the reactor containment building. The loss of power caused those valves to fail safe. The fail safe position for those valves was closed, which meant the steam was no longer going down the pipe, or at least no further than that closed valve. In that case, you have steam still being produced by the decay heat being put off by the fuel in the reactor core, so you had to have something to deal with that energy that's still being produced. At unit one, which was different than units two and three, Unit 1 was the oldest of the reactors at Fukushima. That plant had what was called an isolation condenser, which is shown on the left. It's a big tank of water. 
that has tubes that flow through it. it. Actually, there's two tanks of water, each with tubes flowing through it. Shortly into the accident, whoops, I'll step up. The little valve circled in yellow automatically opened because the pressure inside the reactor vessel was rising too high to protect the reactor vessel from bursting like a balloon or the piping from bursting due to too much pressure. The high pressure automatically opened that valve, allowed steam from the reactor to flow through the tubes inside this large tank of water where it got cooled back down into water and then gravity drained that water back into the reactor vessel. So that isolation condenser controlled the pressure inside the reactor vessel and also controlled makeup. There was no steam leaving. It was all being reused. So the amount of water in the reactor core, reactor vessel was remaining the same. The operators about 11 minutes later turned that system off. As at Three Mile Island, you turn off emergency safety systems. You, you're basically toying with the devil and the devil wins. But they turned the, the safety system off. They closed that valve 11 minutes after it opened because the temperature of the water inside the reactor vessel was cooling down at 300 degrees an hour. It's a big piece of metal, and there's limits on how fast it heats up or cools down because you don't want, you want to control the expansion and contraction so it doesn't break. It was cooling down faster than they wanted it to, well above the 100 degree an hour limit, so they turned the safety system off. When they did that, there's, they lost a way to handle the pressure buildup inside the reactor vessel, so the reactor vessel finds its own way. It uses some safety relief valves that discharge the steam to a different place. That's called the torus or suppression chamber. In this design, it's a large metal ring, looks like a donut made out of metal, nuclear sized, that holds about two and a half million gallons of water. The steam from the reactor vessel is then routed down into this large body of water. That's controlling the pressure, but with no makeup, and there's absolutely no makeup available for this type of plant. The ultimately, as you discharge that steam into the torus, the water level inside the reactor vessel kept dropping. As the steam left, the, there's less and less water inside the reactor vessel. It started out with about 15 feet of water, a normal water level to where the top of the core was. It was just a matter of time before, that's a, I called it the nuclear wick. They, they lit the wick on a nuclear candle. It just took a time for that to melt down. During normal operation, the temperature inside the fuel clad is up to or inside the fuel pellet is up to about 1600 degrees. That heat drops as it moves through the, the gap between the fuel pellets and the fuel rods. Fuel rods are, are 15 foot long hollow tubes of metal with peas, fuel pellets stacked in them like peas in a pod and it welded at top and bottom. Sorry about that, Rob. The, as the fuel temperature inside the fuel goes through that gap that goes through the metal cladding and reaches the water, it drops down to about 560 degrees on the surface of the fuel cladding. As the water level dropped lower and lower, the water's doing less and less cooling, less and less removal of that heat. As a result, the fuel pellets warmed up, the fuel cladding warmed up. As the temperature of the fuel cladding exceeded 1800 degrees Fahrenheit, you start getting a chemical reaction between the water and the zirconium metal that produced a large amount of hydrogen. A very large amount of hydrogen is, fall is created. Hydrogen is, uh, has a lot of uh, good properties, but it also has a lot of negative properties. Anybody remembers the, the Graf Zeppelin, the Hindenburg? Um, when hydrogen ignites, it, it burns very rapidly. There's a system installed at these plants to deal with that, to prevent that. Th there was a lot of talk about the hardened wet, wet, wet. There was, it looks better in print. There was a lot of talk. <laughs> about a hardened vent. I'll just leave out the tough word. <laughs> this diagram shows that hardened vent. It's located on the left-hand side of the screen. The, the turbine is on the right-hand side. The little building that surrounds what looks like an inverted light bulb is the reactor building. The way it's supposed to work, the way it was designed, was that as steam carried hydrogen down into the torus, it, the hydrogen bubbled up through the water and collected in the airspace above the torus, the water in the torus. There's a valve that can be opened that allows that airspace, which includes hydrogen and radioactive materials, to go out through an eight inch diameter pipe directly out to an exhaust in, in the roof of the building. It passes through the reactor building, but it's supposed to be on the inside of that pipe where it goes out through the exhaust, the chimney basically. It didn't work for some reason. 
The operators manually open that, that valve because the valve is motor controlled and without electricity a motor operated valve doesn't move so they had to go down and crank open that vent in an area that's very hot, very dark, and very nasty. It took them a while to do that. It, it took longer than they would have liked. During normal operation, the, the yellow circle surrounds a filter system that's used to filter the radioactive releases from the plant. There's a charcoal filter and a HEPA filter that reduces the amount of radioactivity that's vented out the stack. During accident conditions, there's another filter system that's supposed to do the same thing for anything that collects inside the reactor building. However, both of those systems need electricity to work. Neither of those systems work when you don't have electricity. For reasons unknown, but hard to deny, the hydrogen got into the reactor building and then blew up. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. We're not sure exactly how it happened in any of those times. It wasn't supposed to be in those buildings. There are no detectors to detect hydrogen in those buildings other than missing walls and roofs, perhaps. But at some point on Saturday morning, the March 12th, Unit 1 blew up. The hydrogen collected and detonated, blew out the sides of the building and the roof. The, the schematic on the right shows the Hatch plant in Georgia, which is very similar to the, that plant and many other plants in the United States. Up to the point of the spent fuel pool, it, the concrete walls withstood the hydrogen explosion. From that point on, it's a sheet metal siding, not unlike a Sears storage shed. Again, I have nothing against Sears or their storage sheds, but it's really not a place to store nuclear waste. The picture on the right, or left, kind of shows, proves that out. That's Unit 1 reactor building at Fukushima with the upper parts of the walls and the roof taken away by the explosion. Okay. That's your turn. We're going to flip. All right. Um, unit 1 was the oldest plant and it had this isolation condenser that Dave was talking about. Um, let me step back a little bit though. When uranium splits, 95% of the heat comes from the splitting of uranium. But 5% comes from these pieces that are left over. They're called radioactive daughter products. Now, 5% <clears throat> doesn't sound like a lot, but each of the reactors at Fukushima were producing around 2.5 million horsepower. So 5% of that is still 125,000 horsepower of heat that you had to get rid of after the plant was shut down. And those horses were in a room that was 12 by 12 by about as high as this. So put 120,000 horses in a, room, <clears throat> in a room like that, and you can imagine they're going to churn out a lot of heat that has to be, that has to be dissipated. Um, unit 1 had the isolation condenser, which is really interesting. It's, it's almost identical to a Model T, um, the way the Model T was cooled. Um, the Model T had a gravity-fed cooling system on it. Um, unit 2 and 3 had something called the RCIC uh, turbine, and that's the, that's the first piece of, uh, of information here. Um, this is kind of neat. It, uh, it uses the steam from the nuclear reactor to spin a turbine. <clears throat> Here's the turbine. So just like in Unit 1, there's all this heat-producing steam the isolation valves were closed, so the steam wasn't going anywhere. And the turbine spun, which in turn turned a pump. So there was no electricity required to turn that pump. It was using the decay heat steam, which is kind of neat, except, you guessed it, the valves that worked that system required electricity. So even though the pump and the turbine were, would, have, would have gone on for days, when they lost the control of the valves, the RCIC turbine stopped. Okay, next slide. So what does that do? The fuel gets hot. Um, this is up on our website. There's a, uh, a friend of mine. I had a piece of nuclear fuel um, empty that, um, that I was given when I was in the industry. And it's made of a thing called zircaloy. And zircaloy is really unique um, in that it does what Dave said. It, uh, it can spontaneously um, oxidize. Basically it burns 
when, uh, when water is in touch with it at temperatures over 100, uh, over about 2,000 degrees, 1,800, 2,000 degrees. Well, what my friend and I did with a, with a blowtorch was simulate what happens to zircaloy when it gets to that temperature. Now, this is one fuel element, and there were thousands of those fuel elements at that kind of a condition inside units one, two, and three when the cooling stopped. Um, what happens then is the zircaloy gets r really brittle, and it's being heated from the inside. Uh, the pellets that Dave was talking about are inside that piece of metal there. Um, and um, uh, so the, the metal gets brittle, and these pellets then break and fall out. And as Dave said, the centerline temperature of those pellets is easily over 3,000 degrees. The pellets then fell to the bottom of all the reactors. Whether or not it was unit one or two or unit three, they wound up with this molten pile of pellets on the bottom. Well, there's water over top, and that was cool in the top of them, but in the center, the water couldn't get to. And it easily got to 5,000 degrees and began to eat at the metal at the bottom of the nuclear reactor. We know now that all three nuclear reactors, um, this molten blob melted through about eight inches of steel um, because the isolation condenser and the RCIC turbines failed. Now, what does that do? It creates a lot of hydrogen. In addition, so while the blob is going down, you've got all this hydrogen building up. And next slide. Um, this is um, a camera that was mounted. Um, they're units two, three, and four. By the time this picture was taken, unit one had already exploded. Um, and these, these pictures are at one th uh, three hundredths of a second apart. Um, so, uh, so here we go. This is, um, now you'll see on the fourth slide that. That's a, a, a flame front. And um, I, I calculated that the speed at which it grew, I could scale it off the building. Um, I knew the size of the building and I knew the, the, the duration of the, of the single flame, that that flame front was moving at around 1,000 miles an hour. And what that means, that's called a detonation. When something travels faster than the speed of sound, that's called a detonation. When it travels less than the speed of sound, it's a deflagration. Either one of them are going to hurt you, there's no doubt. Like the Challenger explosion technically was a deflagration, and we all know that, that was catastrophic. But this is worse because the wave front, um, just basically the, the pressure of the wave and the speed of the wave uh, can do enormous damage. This is a problem on all reactors because no one knows why this happened. Um, hydrogen and oxygen at room pressures shouldn't detonate. I talked to a bunch of chemists and we can't figure out how hydrogen and oxygen could detonate. Uh, it can deflagrate, like the Hindenburg, um, but it shouldn't be able to detonate. And that has major ramifications on containment design. Um, containments are not designed to take a detonation wave um, and it can, it can crack it. I, and I hope the NRC uh, pays attention to that. Okay, the two other, two other things here. Th this side of the wave is straight. And the direction is out and to the, to the south, to, 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 your, to my right. Um, and um, uh, I believe that happened because the, the detonation began in the spent fuel pool, which is on that side of the building. That would provide a wall, which it would move straight up against, but the other wall was weak and it would move out. I think that's evidence of the fact that the detonation occurred in the spent fuel pool. Okay, next slide. So now the gases and the, and the cloud of dust and, and the smoke from the explosion begins to dominate and the, um, and the actual flame front begins to um, be obscured. Uh, it's actually there for quite a few frames, but um, at this point, uh, this thing's on its way. Okay, next slide. Now there are those who say that the perfect sphere might, might mean something. I'm not sure that uh, uh, an explosion like that would, would, would not, why wouldn't it 
form a perfect sphere. But anyway, it's going up as a sphere. This is not a nuclear bomb. This is a chemical reaction, um, but um, clearly the, the amount of energy in it is pretty enormous. Okay. Next slide. 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 This is over two seconds. This, this happened over two seconds. Next slide. Looks like a little face up there. Next slide. Now, to give you an idea, this is 50 meters. This is 150 feet, the top of the building. So we're talking something that's up at three or 4,000 feet in, in just a couple seconds. And I think the last slide. Now, the, the rubble is pieces of the roof, but it's also uh, nuclear fuel. And, and that's what's really frightening about this. They were able to find pieces of nuclear fuel about the size of my pinky, um, almost nuked myself in the eye there, um, about the size of my pinky, uh, over a mile away, between a mile and two miles away. And I calculated again how much energy it would take to throw something like that in air, which would have some air resistance. And even if it was a perfect sphere, which had no, very little air resistance, it still would have had to be thrown at around 1,000 miles an hour, which again it indicates that this was a detonation, not a deflagration. I think the nuclear industry is going to argue to downplay the significance of that, but the difference between a detonation and a deflagration is dramatic in containment design. Okay. Now, while that was dramatic, what was, what, that was not what caused the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to, um, to evacuate out to 50 kilometers, 50 miles rather. They were concerned about the spent fuel pool, which would have been more catastrophic than that explosion had it ignited. Um, the spent fuel pool in Unit 4 had the entire guts of the nuclear reactor plus five, six, or seven years worth of nuclear fuel in it. Uh, Brookhaven's done a study where if one of the nuclear fuel pools catches fire, it will kill about 180,000 people from, from the cancers of the airborne plutonium. So it was not that dramatic explosion that convinced Chairman Yasko to evacuate the Americans. It was fear of the, uh, what was really the worst case that hasn't happened yet, and that's the Unit 4 fuel pool igniting. Um, and it's important to note now that Fukushima had dry cask storage, and the dry cask wrote it out just fine. So one message for, these are dry, typical dry casks, there's different designs, but these are dry casks. They were, were hit by the tsunami, they got wet, they got muddy, but they didn't melt and they didn't explode and they're still there today, essentially intact. Um, the, the lesson here for, for both C-10 and Pilgrim Watch is to get as much of the nuclear fuel out of the fuel pools and into dry cask storage where they're much safer. Okay, Dave, I think you're up. I want to talk a little bit about the primary cause of the disaster at Fukushima. This illustration shows a pressurized water reactor like Seabrook. That was intentional because really, no matter what U.S. reactor was faced with, that, with the primary cause of the disaster, the outcome would basically be the same. The timeline might be different, the pathway might be different, but the destination would have been the same. The primary cause was an extended loss of power at a power plant, as ironic as that might be. When the earthquake occurred, the, the normal grid was, was lost, and the plant's own in-plant power from the generator was also lost because, as a result of the earthquake. So the earthquake gave the plant its first strike. It lost its normal supply of the power for the plant. There are backups to that. Each reactor had two emergency diesel generators at the site, installed there for the primary purpose or the sole purpose, not prime, of providing electricity to important plant equipment if the normal source of power was lost. Within six seconds or so, six, ten seconds, 
the emergency diesel generators started and were providing that job of providing electricity to important plant equipment. Not everything, but enough to cool the reactor core and maintain the containment integrity. Then the tsunami arrived. In Japan, they put the emergency diesel generators in the basement of the turbine building. That provided maximum protection against earthquake because if you put something heavy up on stilts and then shake it, it falls. But if you put it down low and shake it, it stays there. So it was maximum protection against the earthquake. They survived the earthquake, but it's not real good protection against floods. And none of them, well, one of them survived. One of the 12 survived the tsunami waves. So the tsunami came in and wiped out the emergency diesel generators to give the plant its second strike. There's a backup to the backup. This plant, as almost all U.S. plants have, were banks of batteries that provide enough power for one safety system per reactor. In Japan, the battery banks were sized to last for eight hours. In U.S. plants, most of our reactors are designed for four hours, so the chances of our reactors surviving better with half the capacity is probably slim. At some point during the accident, the batteries were depleted, giving the plant its third strike, and they weren't bowling, so it wasn't ten strikes they're going for. It was more like baseball. They, they were out. This is a chart from an NRC study done years and years before Fukushima that shows what happens when you lose normal power supply, the backup power supply, and the batteries. And Fukushima was very courteous in following the timeline that had been established years and years ago. The green dotted line vertical is four hours. That's what U.S. plants have battery capacity for. The, eight, the red dotted red line is eight hours. At about five or six hours on this analysis, the batteries were gone. At that point, the, the water level started dropping. The core started heating up. At about 14 hours, 10 to 12 hours, the reactor core had melted, burned through the reactor vessel. A prediction, not a, not a surprise. And a few hours after that, the containment failed. So you have everything bad that can go wrong, was predicted to go wrong many, many years ago. Fukushima showed it three times that this analysis worked. The result, Unit 3 is on the left, Unit 4 is on the right. doesn't really matter. You could swap them. It's not pretty either way. The building exploded. There wasn't even any, there may not have been any fuel in the Unit 4 spent, or Unit 4 core, but it blew up as well. Sympathy pains or something. So the reactor buildings are secondary containment, the last barrier between nasty radioactive stuff and the public, meaning there are no barriers left at Fukushima. This is, This isn't my study, it's not Arnie's study, it's not Ralph Nader's study, it's not Helen Caldicott's study, it's the NRC study from August of 2003. They looked at what would happen at U.S. plants if there was an extended power outage. The NRC, not us. This is the table for pressurized water reactors like Seabrook. The third column over shows the chance of core meltdown due to an extended power outage. The second column shows the overall risk of meltdown for that, that reactor that's calculated by the plant's owner. Again, not me, not Arnie, not Greenpeace or anybody else. And the fourth column is simply the fraction. What percentage of the overall chance of meltdown does station blackout represent? For many plants in the United States, it's a very large chance of meltdown if you lose power for that long. And that's even for plants that aren't on the coast, so it doesn't take a tsunami to knock out the emergency diesel generators at the plants in Illinois. For Seabrook, 22% chance of meltdown by an extended power outage, according to the NRC and the plant's owner. They haven't been saying that very loudly since Fukushima for some reason. This table also shows the battery capacity for U.S. reactors. All the red circles are four-hour plants. Eight hours wasn't enough for Fukushima. Four hours must be enough, according to the NRC, for U.S. reactors. This is the table for boiling water reactors, like Pilgrim and Vermont Yankee. Again, most of the plants have four hours capacity of batteries. 
Many plants have a very high chance of extended power outage leading to core meltdown. There's the LaSalle plant in Illinois, outside of Chicago, not known as a very tsunami risk hazard, high hazard area. 80% chance of core melt due to extended power outage, which means it's equal to four times the risk from all other causes combined. That was the primary cause, and why the, our plants aren't all susceptible to tsunamis, they are susceptible to extended power outages. The August 2003 outage, Hurricane Andrew went through Turkey Point, knocked it off, took its power out for four days. I live in Tennessee, just across the border in Alabama. Tornadoes a couple of weeks ago knocked the Browns Ferry plant for a loop, literally for a loop loss of offsite power. They were several days without electricity. Fortunately, their, their diesel generators worked. Well, most of them worked. They had a few failures, but they worked overall to prevent the hydrogen explosions. The contributing causes, that was the primary cause, loss of, loss of power. The contributing cause was inadequate procedures. While I worked for the NRC, I taught emergency procedures to NRC inspectors. These are some of the charts we used to train them. These are identical to the ones that are used by the operators at Pilgrim, Vermont Yankee, and boiling water reactors in the United States. They provide a lot of information on how to deal with power control, water level inside the reactor vessel, and pressure inside the reactor vessel for all kinds of various scenarios. But that really only works when the accidents follow the script. All of this is based on the assumption that we get power back within four hours, because that's what we assumed. So therefore, by fiat, power is restored within four hours. In Japan, they assumed it was restored within eight hours. So if, it, if, the, if the accident doesn't follow the script, if the power doesn't come back when it's assumed to, the operators have no, no guidance at all on what to do. And they handled that very well, the no guidance, they, they, had, they had no options. It wasn't much that you can do, though. They have a bunch of pumps, a bunch of motors, none of which work without power. So they could have pointed to the various pumps that wouldn't work, but they couldn't point to any that would work. This is an unabridged listing of all the emergency procedures that exist for dealing with spent fuel pool accidents. Every single one of them is listed here. The good news is that the operators can neither forget nor violate procedures that don't exist. I did say I worked for the NRC for a year. I, we can look at the good thing of anything. We think that's an area that needs to be, a gap that needs to be filled. It'd be nice for the operators to have procedures in case there was a spent fuel pool accident at a U.S. plant. Now it's our Easter. A second contributing um, cause of, the, of, of this type of accident, again, it doesn't have to be a Fukushima, it can happen here, is overcrowded fuel pools. When these plants were designed, the plan was that the fuel would stay there for five years and then be shipped to a reprocessing plant. Um, and then uh, I was in the business of building, uh, when I was a senior VP in the industry, one of the things my division did was build nuclear fuel racks. And, and we built nuclear fuel racks sometimes three times for the same client because they would say, well, five, we'll, get, we'll double it and we'll go to 10. Five years later, they'd be back knocking on the door saying we need more. Um, and, and so what has happened is that the uh, fuel racks in the country are chocker block full. Um, the, the reactors like Pilgrim have them very high, there's extra issues there, but, but the, the real issue is when you have all that fuel in one place. There's more cesium in the, um, in the fuel pool at Pilgrim than has be, been released by all the atomic bombs, Chernobyl and Fukushima combined. So if a fuel pool has a fire, the, the, the potential is astronomical for you know, incredible damage. Uh, this is a picture of uh, the Unit 4 fuel pool, um, and it was taken in August, uh, I'm sorry, in April after the explosion, but before uh, most of the uh, water was added back in. And it shows the, um, um, the, the top of the fuel racks are the little tiny boxes, uh, and they are exposed. So they lost enough water to expose the top of the nuclear fuel. And I'll point it out here. But, uh, 
there's a there's a bunch of little boxes in here <laughs> and there's a bunch of little boxes in here and if you're in the building of little box business, they're really obvious, but if you haven't built these little boxes, it might take a little bit of observation. Um, this, this slide's on our website if you want it to look uh, in, in some detail. But um, this is a high density rack. Um, it's not, and the Japanese were much better than the Americans. They kept the fuel there for five, six, seven years and then got it into dry cast storage. Um, the Americans have almost no dry cast storage, just enough to keep enough for a full core offload. Um, so contributing cause number two is the fact that we put too much fuel in our fuel pools and, um, and we need to get it into dry cast storage. Next slide. The, the third cause, and, and um, this is finally becoming uh, discussed, even if the diesels hadn't flooded, Fukushima would have failed anyway because the diesels have their own cooling pumps called service water pumps, and they're right on the water. Well, the tsunami came and inundated the service water pumps, and even after it left, it's hard to get a motor, you know, drop your hair dryer in the kitchen sink and then pull it out and try to turn it on, and it's not gonna work very well. Um, the service water pumps failed at Fukushima as well. So, um, you know, when, when different American reactors will tell you, well, our, our diesels are way up high, it wouldn't happen here. The fact of the matter is that the pump has to be down at the water because that's where the water is. And you can see on this picture, <clears throat> there's a bunch of rubble right here. That's the service water pumps. They were gone. So uh, even if the diesels had survived, even if the diesels had been up higher, you wouldn't have had the water to cool the diesels and we would be in the same situation. And, and again, that's, um, so when people talk about, well, our diesels are different than their diesels, your service water system is not. It's gotta be on the water. So for instance, in, um, um, in um, Florida, at the Turkey Point plant that Dave talked about, um, Hurricane Andrew narrowly missed and they push you up a, a huge wave of water in front. Um, it doesn't take a hurricane much worse than Hurricane Andrew to inundate the service water pumps and, and cause a Fukushima-like accident here. Okay. And last but not least, I think what, what I learned, the lesson I learned is no matter how smart you are, Mother Nature's smarter. Um, th this picture is, is taken last week at a nuclear plant in Nebraska. There's two nuclear plants, I don't know if you've been following this, but if you're in Nebraska, you're following it, you better believe it. Um, there's, um, there's been a lot of runoff, um, there's been an enormous amount of snow in the Rockies. And um, the, several of the rivers that, um, that run down out of the Rockies, and this is the Missouri, are, are um, at flood stage. Actually, they're way over flood stage. Um, the, the Missouri is about ready to breach the, the levees at this nuclear plant. Now, um, that's what we call a design basis accident. That, that's what you build for. And you shouldn't expect to have a design basis accident. Everybody thinks, well, we put some extra heft into this. This is right at the top of the levees now. Yet it happened in 1993 as well. So when you have two design basis accidents in 20 years, the lesson is, you know, maybe we really need to build these levees a little higher. That would be a good idea. But it doesn't happen. Now, um, the other piece of this is that what, what Fukushima told us is that you know, we anticipated a tsunami, but we didn't anticipate the mother of all tsunamis. The reason the, the, the um, Missouri is flooded right now is because there's six dams upstream that are full to capacity, and if they get any fuller, they're gonna break. So all of the pipes are discharging all of the water they can downstream to prevent the dams from breaking. Well, I live in a what-if world. What if one of those dams break? The, the applicant, the, the, the guy who owns this plant doesn't have to design for that. So we are one dam a breakage away from our own Fukushima in Nebraska right now. Now, here, you guys had the Cape Ann earthquake. I don't know if you remember that back in 1690 or something like that. It leveled Boston. and and don't think that the Cape Ann earthquake is the worst that you can expect. 
I mean, Mother Nature's teaching us here that, that she can throw stuff at us. It's a lot more difficult than we've anticipated. Yet the New England plants are designed as their design basis earthquake is Cape Ann. Um, and the records back then were not too, too great. So we're, we're, um, we're going on a, a very slim uh, history. On the west coast, you've got um, Diablo Canyon. Three miles offshore is a fault that they discovered after they built the plant. But it's grandfathered in because they discovered it after they built the plant. And, and down the coast is uh, San Onofre, and the, the tsunami wall there is nine meters or about 28 feet. Um, I think you know, we need to reevaluate. Mother Nature can do a lot more to us than we want to believe can happen. Okay, Dave, yours. Okay, after laying what the, some of the problems are, what we need is NRC in action. Oops. NRC in action, sorry. Whoops. Okay. Yeah, we need NRC, in, we need three words. NRC in action is what we need. It's difficult to get. I've worked for, NRC, for UCS for 14 years, and it's very difficult. <laughs> and having worked for the NRC, one of the problems I left was that there wasn't enough action. It, was, it wasn't stress that was a problem. It was shelf life. It's not real strenuous work, working for the NRC. This is a uh, schematic of a pressurized water reactor. What I want to talk about here is some of the safety problems the NRC knows about that they're not fixing at U.S. reactors, putting you in elevated risk. They've known about it. This first problem I'm going to talk about, they first warned the president about it a few years ago. The president they warned was Jimmy Carter, and the problem has still not been fixed. It's not Jimmy Carter's fault. I believe it's the NRC's fault. The problem is, in a pressurized water reactor, if a pipe breaks that's connected to the reactor vessel, the water inside the cooling the reactor escapes through the broken pipe very rapidly. The initial response for the system is to put a high-pressure tank of water that has nitrogen pressure above it that rapidly injects that water into the piping to replace the water that's escaping out through the broken pipe. That initial makeup water gives enough time for the pumps to automatically start on the left to transfer water from a tank out back into the reactor vessel to replace the water that's flowing out both ends of the broken pipe. At some point, that ta tank outside is going to empty. So the next step is to take the water that's collecting in the basement of the reactor and send that through the same pumps, just realign where they're getting their water, to send that back in to cool the reactor. It spills out through the broken pipe, ends back up in the basement, and you just recycle that water to, re to cool the reactor. The problem that the NRC has known about is that the violence of water jetting out the broken ends of the pipe scours paint off walls, coating insulation off piping, and any other loose material in the way and carries it down into the basement where it clogs the screens just like here in a bathtub drain and the water stays in the tub instead of getting to the pumps. The NRC knows about that since they warned President Carter in 1978. This is an NRC study of what's the chances of this happening at the 69 pressurized water reactors in the United States. The red boxes, according to the Sandia National Lab, is very likely to cause a reactor meltdown at U.S. reactors. I'll speed this up a sec. A mere 53 of the 69 reactors are very likely to have this meltdown if there's an accident. <coughs> 53 out of 69 since 1978. The good news is that the NRC has asked plant owners to fix this problem, giving a toaster oven to the first one who did it, <laughs> which turned out to be Davis Bessie for other reasons. But many of the reactors are now fixed. They've in put larger screens inside the containment so it takes more debris to clog it. At the same time, they've replaced the paint and the coatings and other materials inside containment to make it less susceptible to be broken up and carried down into the containment. So they, those reactors that have fixed the problem have really lessened the likelihood that that problem exists. However, there are 20 reactors that have said, just said no, followed Nancy Reagan's edict and just said no. And the NRC has said, please? And the NRC, yeah, no, sorry. We're trying to get the NRC to get those 20 reactors to fix this problem that many other reactors have fixed, and hoping in the meantime that this doesn't happen at the plant in your backyard, because it's very likely that it won't work. But that's only if it fails. Earlier, 
than President Carter being warned. There was a fire at the Browns Ferry plant in Alabama that was owned and operated by the Tennessee Valley Authority. A worker using a candle to look for air leaks started a fire, as candles have been known to do. Mrs. O'Leary's cow has an alibi, but the worker using a candle to look for air leaks started a fire that was in the room just below the control room. All the cables from the control room passed through this room, right below the control room, and then went out to various equipment in the plant. So the plant had all of its electricity, but all the cables between the controls in the control room and the equipment in the field was lost. Unit 1 at Browns Ferry lost all of its emergency equipment. The fire damaged all the cables. Unit 2 lost most of the safety systems due to the fire. So the NRC said, we don't, this is too close. They adopted rules in May of 1980 to prevent the next Browns Ferry. This is the NRC's list of plants that don't meet those regulations and don't meet an alternative set of regulations that the NRC adopted in 2004, saying, could you please meet one of the set of regulations? Just say no. Fifty reactors in the United States, roughly half the fleet, are not protected in case of a fire for regulations that were adopted three decades ago. NRC in action. And ironically, one of the plants that doesn't meet the regulations is Browns Ferry in Alabama that started it all. Has absolutely no excuse, but they don't meet it. Doesn't need to explain, but roughly, ten, roughly a decade ago, nine, we suffered 9-11. The NRC after 9-11 imposed security requirements for plants to meet to make their plants less vulnerable to acts of malice. Today, the NRC knows that there are several plants that don't meet those regulations. Their owners have said, can we have more time? Apparently, we're waiting for terrorists to retire, is our new safety protection system. I just assume that we actually, if, there, if we identify security shortcomings, we go out there and fix them. We don't put them on a list and ask and beg and co you know, coax the plant owners to meet the security regulations. It'd be nice if the NRC enforced its own regulations. NRC in action. Ernie and I were going to talk about some of the things that have been done at other places to try to address some of these issues. About 12 years ago, the NRC appointed me to a Federal Advisory Committee Act panel. That's an, an advisory bo body legally chartered to look at specific activity. In this case, it was the reactor oversight process. There was a number of industry representatives, a number of N uh, NRC officials, there were a number of state officials on the panel, and there was a token NGO, a token public member of the public um, serving on that panel to look at how the NRC's pilot reactor oversight process was working. The good news about that panel was that it was a consensus panel, so even the, every member's view had to be reflected in the final outcome. It wasn't a majority-minority report. So when they did the follow-up study, they changed it to a majority-minority point, so it didn't matter what I said anymore. Um, <laughs> But at least on the initial one, it was a good oversight process. And the reason I think there might be some value in this going forward is if the NRC established a similar panel to look at lessons learned from Fukushima and how they're implementing them, we think it would be valuable to have public represented on that panel. We'd like to see at least one member from a local group, from a regional group in Region 1, Pilgrim Watch, C-10 or somebody, also Region 2, the Southeast, the West and the Midwest. The public at the moment doesn't fully trust the NRC for some reason. And it would be good to have public representative, to have the public's concerns brought forth to the NRC and have the NRC's actions or explanations for justifications for whatever they're doing or not doing reported back to the... So I think that partnership would be better than the current system. So that there has some value going forward. I'll let Arnie talk about... He, he was the chair of a panel in, at the state level in Vermont that I served on briefly before going to the NRC. Oops, sorry. A little <coughs> answer. The... Um, the other example is uh, what we did in Vermont. Um, the legislature enacted a law and um, uh, empowered five people. One was uh, appointed by the governor, one was appointed by the president pro tem of the state senate, and one by the, um, the, the majority leader of the House. Uh, those three then chose two more people to fulfill a five-person panel. Um, the difference between what we looked at and what Dave looked at is that um, states are not allowed to bump into the NRC's jurisdiction, and we couldn't look at safety. 
we could look at reliability. So for instance, the emergency core cooling systems were not a topic that we were allowed to look at. Um, but if the testing of the emergency core cooling systems was likely to impact uh, the length of an outage, that became a reliability issue. Um, we issued a report after um, about $9 million worth of work by consultants. I'd like to say that went to me, but it didn't. You know, but they, there were a, a team of consultants brought in to answer uh, a matrix of questions. We had 13 different parameters, and we looked at six different systems, so six by 13. And we had um, problems in 81 different areas that the uh, panel identified. Now, I, I always wondered, uh, Rather than suffer the, the public relations uh, problems of having outsiders find the 31, the, the 81 problems, why Entergy didn't do it themselves, um, but they, they, they chose not to. Um, the next year, uh, they didn't quite tell us the truth about an underground pipe, and uh, we were reconvened and found another nine problems. So this public oversight group effectively identified 90 problems uh, at, um, at Vermont Yankee, um, and it will take until at least about 2015 or 2016 till all of those issues are resolved, and of course the license ends in 2012. So um, uh, we shall see whether the extension occurs or not. But it was um, uh, as effective a process as any state has come up with to, uh, to shine the light on the inner workings of a, of a nuclear power plant. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.